Alrighty, uh, thanks everybody for being here. So welcome to the May 2019 edition of A2 New Tech Meetup. I'm your host, David Nesmit, and um, I've been here in Ann Arbor for 10 years now, and working in tech for about five of those years, and I help to manage a portfolio of academic tools at the University of Michigan. So I work a couple blocks away from here. And this meetup has been running ever since 2009. Um, so we've, this is our 10th anniversary year. And we've had, in that time, over 100 meetups, over 350 companies pitch, and we have 7,200 members and climbing in the meetup group. Um, if you know people that are in the technology community in Ann Arbor um, that, are, that don't know about this group, make sure to let them know, invite them out, um, and uh, have them come out and meet some other folks who are working in technology or interested in that in the area. Um, last year we had almost 60 pitches, so we have a lot of companies um, and new tech innovation that's coming through the doors here and pitching. Um, and this group you can think about as kind of a friendly front door for entrepreneurship in Michigan. Um, sometimes it can be challenging to make the connections you want to make or learn about who's out there working on what, especially when they're just getting started. Um, this is one of those places where you can make those connections and learn and meet the people that are uh, working in the areas you're interested in. So a question for us to get a sense of who's in the room. Who's a uh, first timer at A2 New Tech, first time out tonight? Don't be shy, there'll be a lot of you. Um, yeah, awesome. So usually we have about 50% um, new people every month. And um, so you can tell people if you come out for the first time, you're not going to be alone. There's a lot of other new people. Um, and who in the room is hiring? Hiring for position, your company's hiring, you know of a position. And who's looking for a new opportunity, looking for the next opportunity? Awesome. So hopefully some of those people can connect um, and learn about some opportunities, uh, make some um, introductions tonight. So this monthly gathering time at our A2 New Tech Meetup, it gives us a chance to learn about what's going on in the community. So kind of who's working on what, um, who are the people that are engaged in this community and coming out tonight. Um, you get to meet the other people who are building and shaping the future of tech in Ann Arbor. There's a ton of exciting things happening in tech in Ann Arbor. Um, just, I mean, often you'll hear about new companies that are getting investment, that are growing, that are hiring people, new companies that are launching. Um, and so this is the place where you can come and meet some of the people that are helping make that happen. Um, and I would encourage you as you're here tonight, we all have you know, reasons why we're coming, uh, things we want to learn about or people we want to meet, connections to make, um, something we want to promote. But I encourage you to think about how you can help someone that you meet tonight. Because everyone here, if you look to the left and right, they all have their own things they're looking to get. Some of them are younger or just looking to break into technology. Um, and so see if you can help them with an introduction or help them learn something tonight. Um, tell them about something that will help them along in their path. And then afterwards, make sure to join us at Dominic's um, to eat some free pizza courtesy of Ann Arbor Spark. And that's a great time in our networking time afterwards to deepen connections and talk a little bit more and meet more of the people you don't get to meet um, in this room. No, it's Dominic's, not. It's pizza Dominic's, house. not Pizza House, yes. So we've been at Pizza House all winter and spring is now almost kind of here. And um, so it's like. A block there. It's like a block over here, so it's very close. Um, so we'll just walk over there afterwards about 8 p.m. In the next month, um, if you want to stay connected to people in the community and um, chat with other people from A2 Tech, um, you can do that at our Slack team, um, which you can find at madeina2.com slash slack. So madeina2.com slash slack, and that will let you join the team. Um, in, that, in that, there's a variety of channels related to technology in the community. So jobs, there's an audio file channel for people talking about like super high-end headphones and things like that. Um, you have general announcements, and so a lot of different things, like events that are getting announced there. So it's a great way to connect with uh, people that are in what's happening in the tech community in the, in the next month before we actually come back together. So I encourage you to join that, keep an eye on that once in a while, pop in there, um, and it's a good way to stay connected. So before we continue, I want to take a quick second to thank some of the people and organizations that make this event possible. You don't go over 10 years running monthly like this without a lot of help. Um, and so A2 Geeks, uh, is first I want to thank is a nonprofit dedicated to making Southeastern Michigan and Ann Arbor a great place for geeks and creatives to live, work, and play. Um, Roger Rail from R2 Vibe is doing our video tonight, so let's give a hand to Roger for volunteering. So he does this every month, which is awesome and a huge help. And so you can find videos of all of our uh, meetups um, on his YouTube page. He will link to it um, often in a comment on the meetup. So if you go to the last meetup, you can see that um, recap video. So it's a great way to see meetups that you missed or share it with someone that you think should see them. 
And if you have, uh, if you want to hire Roger for this kind of work or anything else with video, um, look up R2 Vive on Google. I also want to thank some of the co-organizers. So it takes some work to curate the presenters every month and to uh, make sure we have quality pitches up here. And so I want to thank Doug Song, Zach Steinler, Scott Gosey, David Bloom, David Corcoran, Brian Kelly, Brooke Boyle, and all others. Um, these are some of the organizers that have made this event happen for the last 10 years and put in a lot of time to make sure that this full room can get something quality every time they come. Um, another one I want to thank, which is really important, is the Entrepreneurship Clinic here at the U of M Law Clinic, um, or at the U of M Law School. Dana Thompson is the founding director of the Entrepreneurship Clinic for Michigan Law. And so they help us get the space every month. So we have this beautiful room and um, great technology for the projector and everything because they help us out. And so if you're a company in Michigan, especially a startup, you can get free IP, corporate, and other legal services from law students here at the university. So I'd encourage you to check out the, your, the Entrepreneurship Law Clinic at U of M if you're interested in that. And you can contact Laura Schiltz, who is the clinic administrator, if you want to learn more. And then lastly, uh, but not least, Ann Arbor Spark, I mentioned, is sponsoring our pizza. So Ann Arbor Spark is committed to bringing together organizations and individuals to support the growth of companies and creations of jobs here. And so uh, we really appreciate them sponsoring our pizza every month. They've been doing this for quite a while. Um, and uh, Ann Arbor Spark has, um, has locations in Ipsy and Ann Arbor, and so you probably recognize them, maybe see them around. Alrighty, so that uh, concludes kind of the um, housekeeping things for tonight. Um, but the agenda for tonight, we're going to go until about 8 p.m. And then, like I mentioned, we'll be heading over to Dominic's um, to do some networking. Uh, we have five companies that are pitching tonight, and each of them will do a five-minute pitch, followed by a five-minute Q&A for that pitch. Um, and so make sure to write down your questions as you're listening to the pitches. Think about what you want to ask. Um, that will really help the whole group get more out of those pitches and learn more about these companies. And um, after that time, we'll have a community announcements time after those companies pitch and do their Q&A. Then we have community announcements. So if you have a, um, a meetup you want to promote or an event you want to let people know about, you're looking for a collaborator on something or you have a position you're hiring for, um, take note of that announcement. And at the end of the community announcements time, you can come up and make that announcement. Last thing I'll say before we start our pitches is that um, make sure, two things I'll say actually, make sure to silence your phones. Um, so I know it's sometimes easy to forget that. Um, so make sure to silence your phone so they don't interrupt pitches. And if you're tweeting or Instagramming, use the hashtag A2NewTech. Um, and if you have a question you'd like to ask during the Q&A portion, this is something I always like to remind us. Um, one, try to keep it to one question. So give people, other people in the audience time to ask their questions. If you ask several follow-ups, it makes it hard for other people to have time to ask their question. Um, so try to keep it to one question if possible. And then do ask it in the form of a question. A lot of people in the room may have you know, thoughts or advice for these companies as they're pitching about what they should do. Um, but save that for afterwards and maybe in a personal conversation with them after their pitch is done and when everyone's just mingling, you can share that with them. But during the Q&A, please ask everything in the form of a question so they can respond and everyone in the group can get something out of it. So that's it. Um, before, uh, without further ado, let's jump into the pitches. And so tonight we have a great lineup, and the first one pitching is Springship. And Andrew Reed is going to come up and pitch Springship for us. So Springship is a mobile tool, a web-based application, which supports a community to quantify relationships and positive experiences. Awesome. Thank you very much for your time. Thanks. How many of you have seen that Black Mirror episode where they rate people? Quite a number of you. How many of you have heard of the People app a couple of years ago? where they rated people, total disaster, right? And how many of you have heard of the Zima Credit, social credit system over in China? Quite a number of you. We believe that the ultimate emergence of putting human life online is inevitable. And we think those failures have missed something that we think we found. Springship is an event-based organization that utilizes technology to create the most empathetic and well-connected community in the world. Let's talk about the problem we're solving, if the clicker will work. Try clicking the screen on the laptop. Yeah, yeah. Or on that computer. Maybe, maybe not. Unless I go to presenter view. Now does it work? Now it works. Awesome. Number one cause of death and disability. Literally the biggest problem in the world. It causes or it affects 20% of the population. Many experts believe social media is a primary culprit. 
you've heard of these three issues already, depression. You go online, you see everybody else's amazing life, you have a fear of missing out, makes you feel like crap. Anxiety, you feel like you can't connect with people, you're afraid of judgment, you don't know how to have in real life conversations anymore, so you feel massive anxiety. And all of this is precipitated by the reality that billion dollar companies are trying to make this as addictive as possible. These are the potential solutions that exist thus far. Frankly speaking, as much respect as I have for the medical community, that's where I come from myself, we're not cutting it. If we were, the problem wouldn't continue to get worse. What we believe is that we're trying to apply old solutions to a completely new problem. And what we need to do is we need to apply a new solution to a new problem. And even better yet, we need to use what they're used to, social media, to help guide them in a more socially responsible way. So that's what we're going to do. This is the spring ship, spring ship solution. It's three steps. First, we're going to host safe and healthy events, stuff like co-counseling, community service, stuff like mental health awareness. We're going to provide an opportunity for people to make in real life connections with other people that suffer like them. Next, we're going to use technology. This is the spring ship technology. We're going to allow you to have private communications, private communications to learn how to create better relationships. And by quantifying this, you can create an entirely new addiction. Only this one is based on in real life relationships, empathy, learning how to understand people, and dare I say it, improving your community. This is what it actually looks like. You go to an event, you use our technology to record that you were at this event. You communicate, they don't even need to be a SpringShift user, we've already figured out that te technology. You communicate privately to them. This is different from Black Mirror in two ways. Number one, it's 100% private unless I choose to put it online. Secondly, is I have to initiate it. I have to go to my friend and say, I would like to make a better relationship with you. Can you show me how? Versus Black Mirror or frankly Facebook, you can go to them and say, hey, you suck right out of the gate. This is not that technology. You have to initiate it. And lastly, like I said, by recording it and growing it, you can create a completely new kind of addiction. Now, all of this is great, but it's technology, right? Easily copied, Facebook's gonna pick it up tomorrow. But for those of you that saw the Game of Thrones final episode, the most powerful thing in the world is an amazing story. And very fortunately, we already have that. Humbly speaking, it starts with me. I was Wayne State's first ever combined college ceremony commencement speaker. I got into a top 50 US med school, married the woman of my dreams. And over the course of six years, I lost everything. I got to see what true darkness feels like, depression and anxiety, and how debilitating it is. And that's why I know this solution will work. And I get to make my personal comeback in a place literally known as the Comeback City. A place that is absolutely perfect for an idea like this to take root. And if and when we fulfill the destiny written on the flag, we hope for better things that will rise from the ashes, we're gonna merge with our neighbor next door, who just so happens to be the smartest city in the country. That's literally you guys in this room and ladies. We're gonna merge and we're gonna create the number one place for community. Austin, Texas did that for creativity. US News and World Report says they're the number one best place to live in the country. We're gonna do that for community. And once we do that, we're gonna become a beacon of hope. We're gonna realize that we can create an entirely new way of living, where you bring story of Detroit with the smarts of Ann Arbor to create something completely and totally new. And we're gonna address the biggest issues that all of us are walking into. Now this sounds great and I've got 18 seconds, so I'm gonna fly on this one. Foundation, we've got the people, trust me on this, we've got the right people. We've got the product, we're MVP ready. We've got the plan, one, four, and 10 years. This is where we're at now. We need to meet with 100 people that want the exact feature that they're looking for. This is what we need help with. And this is our plan to actually go about doing it. One, two, three. Scale, when we go scale, we have five unique ways of making significant amounts of money, and this is the help we need. Help us to refine our product, help us to find people that actually want to improve their relationships, want to emerge through their mental health issues, want to create a stronger sense of community. If you know investors or organizations that want to partner, please reach out, let me know. And lastly, if you really believe in this story, those are the positions we're looking for. So last thing I'll say is we are merging into technology, this is a tool that's going to help guide that in the most socially responsible way. You guys can decide what, what side of history you want to be on. Thank you. Wow, five minutes goes fast. <laughs> okay, who's got questions for Andrew? Yes, right here. 
And what's your plan on hiring, like, are you planning on hiring medical professionals that like, train individuals to talk to your clients, users? One of the issues we're realizing is there's a lot of red tape with mental illness, specifically targeting mental, po mental illness populations. So one of the things that we're considering right now is just a mental improvement app. Does that make sense? We have discussed with multiple, I'm from the medical background myself, we've talked with a lot of doctors, a lot of psychiatrists, psychologists. They believe that this has potential. No one's signed on just yet because we're pre-funded. So we don't have anybody that we can afford just yet. Make sense? So it's like a forum. Sorry? It's like a forum. Like you could consider it that. We consider it something a lot more. We consider it a completely <coughs> new sense of value based on relationships and a sense of purpose towards a greater cause that is quantified in the last <coughs> year. Great question? Sorry. So what's being quantified? I mean, are they different personality traits or are you going to find somebody that would mesh well with somebody else based on different metrics or? Great question. The idea that we have is, say you and I have an interaction, I would use the Springship technology to communicate to you, hey, I thought this was a plus three, that highest scale possible, best thing in the world. You communicate back to me, it was a plus one. It was good. It wasn't the best. Here's the way it can be better. You can quantify the amount of time, money, and energy that was expenditure, or ex expense, whatever, um, multiply it by those two factors, and now you have a quantified factor. So it's not really <coughs> a tricky algorithm. It's just about quantifying what you care about. And if you don't care about relationships or experiences, we're not the right tool for you. Great question, thank you. Stand there. Oh, sorry. Right here? We'll right. 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 Mental right. health has a huge uh, breadth of different conditions from uh, situational uh, depression to serious things like schizophrenia. <clears throat> are you taking all comers or are you specifically looking for like the more along the line of the I've had a bad go of things and now I'm depressed and I just need to kind of connect with other people? Probably that one. The second one, just to relate to what he was saying, is we'd like to help as many people as possible. And we do believe that although 20% of the population seriously suffers, there's a lot more that go undiagnosed. So we want to help the people that are looking to just improve their mental awareness. Because yes, serious conditions like schizophrenia, they're probably outside of our range, at least in the interim. You said this is going to be uh, start out with events. Uh, have you done any events up to this point? We've had two. We're very new, so we're uh, we're just getting off the ground right now. Which is why I wanted to come and meet with people that might be able to help us. So, um, you mentioned financials. Do you have like unit costs or anything like that, um, like projections on? We plan on selling this for around five or ten dollars, and right now we're doing market research to see if that's like actually feasible. But we believe that if and when this technology does, we'll be able to. Yeah. And that's a, so is that yearly or monthly? Still monthly. Uh, how did you arrive at the idea of uh, the technology? How did I come up with this? Yeah. So when I was in med school, um, I was married and I, I fought with my wife nonstop. And it sucked because I loved her and I still kind of do, to be honest. And I, wow, it still hurts. Um, yeah. I wanted to learn how to improve my relationship with her and I realized that I didn't really have a tool that could do that. I wanted to do things that would make her life better, that she agreed would make her life better. Not for any like kudos or anything, I mean just to learn what can I do to improve your life. And I, as I started to realize med school is not the right path for me, um, my wife and I decided to go separate ways. I realized that this tool has a very large scale applicability, which is why I had to dedicate my life to it. Can you? I have a question. Can you tell us about the events that you guys are in? What were they like? So the first one was community service. Um, it was simple. We just went to a, a farm house kind of thing. Um, the other one was a mental health awareness. We uh, we met with psychologists. We had like five people show up. So admittedly, we're still kind of <coughs> starting off. But sure. yeah. I think I saw one over here. Yeah. Are there any other like support groups that that you guys are modeling this off of, or like support groups that you feel personally work really well? I mean. That is one of our user groups that I flew by because we believe this application would be used for any organization. One of our first user groups is my old fraternity, Sigma Pi. We believe that when you start quantifying and allowing people to create honest and clear communication, and you quantify that you can literally see that organization become more connected, it can theoretically help any support group, any organization, any business. So. All right, that's about all the time we got. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right, and our next uh, company presenting is Intivo.
and Assam al Zukri is presenting. So Intipo uses behavioral artificial intelligence to break through the boundaries of autonomous vehicle technology and improve safety. So they combine advanced vision systems with a complex and robust data set to bring true understanding of human behavior to the road. Hello everyone, uh, my name is Assam Zokri, I'm the founder and CEO at Invo. Invo is a startup here in Ann Arbor that mainly focus on predicting human behavior. Everything is all about safety. Pedestrian that has been on the rise for over a decade, reaching the highest level since 1990, and that's like 30 years in a row. And we believe one of the main causes of this is distractions. We have a distracted pedestrians who are walking on the street and they're not paying attention to the vehicle, looking at their cell phone, and they're crossing the street. And we have a distracted driver. Drivers are really distracted as well. So that's a, comp that's a deadly combination between a distracted driver and a distracted pedestrians. The good thing is, is that there's many companies who are really focusing on developing fully autonomous vehicle to eliminate the distracted driver. But what about pedestrians? Pedestrian will always be on the street, they will always be distracted, and they always have the right to cross the street. And that's exactly what we do in Evo. We're building a software that looking at the human body, understanding their intention, understanding the level of distractions. Um, so we're, we're not only just focusing on detections, classification, and tracking. We're going a little bit deeper further to understand their level of distraction, the level of intention before crossing the street. And I'll show the video. This is our software. We're, we are actually this is in, in, at Yovan. We're tracking people, we're understanding where they're going, how fast they're going, and we're also understanding the distance they are from from the vehicle. And then we can classify if these people are crossing or not crossing. Are these people have are, are they holding a cell phone or are they holding holding a water or so on? We kind of looking at their body and language, understanding their kind of level of of, of distractions and also the level of intention, intention before crossing the street. So this is kind of a quick overview of what we're doing. So as you can see, we have like four icons. The first one is to classify that if the person has intention to cross the street, and then we have the eye icon, which represents awareness, if you are aware, if you pay attention to the road, and then we have distractions. So we look at multiple things in the human body to understand the distractions. Holding a phone, you're not looking or so on, and that's what we do in classification. And then we have the third one is the waving. You know, if you're waving at the vehicle, what does that mean? Does that mean thank you for crossing the show? Does that mean stop? And so on. So we kind of look at the human body and understand their level of uh, intention. Another scenario is awareness. This is the same thing. We classify and this as a medium risk. The person is crossing the street, but he's looking at the vehicle. And he's distracted. And as well, as you can see, he's, he's kind of, uh, you know, not waving at the vehicle. Another one, as again, this lady, she's crossing the street. She's, she's distracted. She's, uh, she's, she's not looking at the vehicle, and then we classify this one as a high risk. Another story, imagine if, you, if it's an autonomous vehicle, and if it's a work construction, and he's you know, giving a direction to autonomous vehicle. In that scenario, we classify and understand what is the meaning of, of, of the directions. In this scenario, he's, he's giving a direction to turn left. So we both forsake algorithm, which start with the image processing, which everybody's doing, but we mainly focus on the human behavior, which is the behavior modeling, and then we do the predictions. This is when we predict the human behavior, and then we assign the risk uh, assessment to understand if the person's in a higher risk or in the low risk. And today I'd like to share with you that we are having three pilots, two in Michigan and one in Ohio. The one and two in Michigan, we are a partner with uh, the city of Grand Rapids and Main Mobility. I'm sure you guys are familiar with Main Mobility as well as uh, University of Michigan of Transportation Institute. Um, and then the last one is Ohio Toledo. We're partnered with Tarda to kind of start installing our hardware and software into the bus system to track human behavior. Um, so I'm gonna go, go quick here. So we're, we're, we're gonna start with gathering more data. And then after that, we're doing uh, testing. And then we're gonna do the um, uh, alert system to the driver. So this is a similar thing for Grand Rapids. We're doing this similar thing, gathering data, and then start doing testing, and then we're gonna do um, a kind of a driver alert system to kind of drive up, to give alerts to the driver. Um, another scenario, this is actually in Michigan. We have cameras mounted on the street, looking looking down at the people, and then we're tracking people before crossing the street if they're distracted or where they're going. Um, and this is the same scenario. We will provide some alert system to the driver as well. 
So we've been gathering data since we started. We're gathering data in the United States, in different countries, and looking at our data set is mostly looking at different cultural behavior to understand people behavior. Because if you travel from the United States to India or China, people behave differently. And we're trying to understand this kind of behavior. So that's a cultural behavior. Um, so this is our market that we're targeting. We're targeting in the automotive market, as I mentioned, and in, in our autonomous vehicle, ADAS, and robotics. Um, and this is kind of the people that we work with. Um, this is kind of to explain the roadmap that, that we're you know, working on right now. And actually today we're looking for a seed fund for $1.5 million um, kind of to give us, to help us to kind of achieve our milestones. And these are our partners that we work with right now. And we're looking for more partners in the future. Thank you. <laughs> Questions for Assam? Over here, right side. Cyclists too, or just pedestrians? So yeah, that's vulnerable road users. We're looking at everybody. So either your bicycles, motorcycles, a disabled person as well. So we're looking at the entire thing. So we're trying to understand what people are doing. So we don't look at the guest uh, pedestrians. Um, but we don't, as, as, as I mentioned, so we don't focus on the driver's behavior because we believe drivers will be eliminated because of the autonomous vehicle. So we mainly focus on the vulnerable road users. Back row. Uh, I just want to clarify, this is for basically when there is a need for decision, decision tree, uh, you know, analysis kind of, meaning if, if for the pedestrian the light is red, any movement, whatever that is, interaction awareness, that should be disregarded because they will be breaking the rules. So if the pedestrian has the right to cross the street and the light is green to take, for example, a right turn or something. Mm -hmm. That's when you have to analyze this behavior, correct? Well, it doesn't matter. Either you're turning left, you turn right, or if, even if it's red light. We have to always keep constantly looking at pedestrians and addressing their behavior. Because even sometimes, if it's a red light, pedestrians will cross the street, it doesn't matter. So people really behave. If you travel to New York City, people don't even wait for the traffic light. Even if they start it, they just cross the street. Um, so we track pedestrians in all time. We try to make sure they're, you know, kind of distracted. Where they're going? How fast they're going? Um, yeah, and, and I'm wondering if you then also incorporate the city data, the light that the pedestrian should follow. Are you also incorporating that data in the predictive model? Well, that's that's what we're working with the University of Michigan Transport Institute because they already have devices uh, mounted on the streets, so we can even tr control the, the traffic light as well if, if there's a need for that. Yeah, I might have missed it. How frequently do you update the level of distraction? Because I might not be looking at my phone and then suddenly Correct. my phone rings and so I was totally low Correct. risk. I looked at that car, my phone rings, suddenly I'm totally distracted. So what is your question if you don't mind? How fast, how frequently do you update the risk factor? So is it every second, every 10 seconds? How frequently do you update the risk factor of an individual walking person? So we, we're updating every millisecond. So, oh, so we, we're actually doing it, in, it in all the time. So. Appreciate that. So if, if, because if we're driving a vehicle on the road and there's a delay, and our software causing a delay, that's a big problem. So our job is safety, and this is our main uh, you know, kind of mission is to increase the safety. Uh, but yeah, that's a good question. Right here in front. Okay. Um, so from what I understand, this, is, this will be on top of the existing autonomous uh, driving system. Correct. Um, well, you are uh, well. You guys have worked with uh, some of uh, the uh, existing autonomous vehicle companies. How easy it is to integrate with their existing system? Well, for us, we're not we're not replacing anything in their software. Mm -hmm. So we're just adding a layer into their software because the current technology right now are doing detections, tracking, and classifications. So we're already doing that, and we know everybody's doing that. So we're not coming to replace anything. We're coming just to add more layers to increase the intelligence of the autonomous vehicle. <laughs> so that's kind of our job is to you know, add layers into the autonomous vehicle. So are you adding, oh, I'm sorry, are, are you adding uh, the prediction factor to the equation? Correct, so we're adding like three layers. Predictions, uh, I mean, sorry, models, behaviors, and predictions, and risk. 
Number one, uh, go ahead. Are you planning to sell this as a specific API <coughs> that companies can work with and call, or is this plan to be a separate device or something you plug in the vehicle? Good. So actually, uh, I know I, I didn't. I actually went so quick on the uh, model, business model. So technically, we're planning to work with the robotics, and we are already working with the robotics, where we integrate our software into the into the robot. So we, and also we are planning to integrate the chipset, the embedded system, which will be running on in any device if you would like to. And also we do licensing. So we license to automotive companies like Ford, GM, Chrysler, and even automotive suppliers uh, to work with them. So that's a, you know, kind of our business plan. All right, that's all the time we got. Thank you. And our next company is 8 Mile Logistics, LLC. So Benjamin Mesa Wilson is here to present. And 8 Mile Logistics is a mobility service for underserved industry workers in Washtenaw County. And interesting fact about Benjamin, his parents are lifelong entrepreneurs, most recently as chocolatiers. everyone, I'm Ben Mesa Wilson. I talk about my startup, 8 Mile Logistics, which is a micro transit um, EV shuttle service. Um, so basically the problem is that um, there's a low skill uh, labor shortage going on in downtown Ann Arbor. Um, I actually went to a mobility conference last year and the community and economic development director talked about this where Simultaneously, there's all these jobs that are available in downtown Ann Arbor, and there's all of these workers that live in Ipsland and Township, and they did a three-year study into what the main barrier for that was, and it was lack of reliable transportation. Um, so this is for people that can't take the bus because they're working at a bar or restaurant that closes at one or two o'clock, and um, people actually get let go at the end of the night um, slowly. So they need a, a, a different uh, solution other than um, what is available right now. Uh, let's see. So this is uh, the restaurant industry. And here's the restaurant industry is experiencing rapid growth. Um, how it's getting solved right now, there's some employers that are giving Uber rides to their employees to get home. There's the AAATA night ride, which is a service that's subsidized in part by the DDA, um, or just bumming a ride from a friend. Um, so, so we're seeing a lot of new mobility options that are out there. We see these two scooters that are around. Um, we can get, we can hail a ride with a Uber or Lyft. <coughs> So I think this idea is kind of taking the best of both worlds. Micromobility is kind of a cute idea and everything, but who is it really a mass appeal where people are going to get on a scooter and use that as their main mode of transportation, especially in Michigan where we have weather and things like that. Um, and at the same time, Uber and Lyft are great, but they're a point-to-point -point solution, so they are um, contributing to congestion because they're getting on the same roadway with the rest of us and and occupying it. So this one so this so for this is basically where you get in a shuttle to get a ride, but just in your specific district and you don't venture out of that. So you get that short distance aspect of micro mobility and that on demand ride aspect of like Uber and Lyft. Um, and there's zero emission, and <clears throat> this is a stepping stone to self-driving vehicles um, because um, I want to use um, Polaris Gem vehicles, and those are retrofit ready to be fully autonomous. And <clears throat> the problem, there's problems with autonomous vehicles, but some of the main problems with it is that there's no path to go from where we are today to having a, a fully autonomous vehicle on the road that's holistic. So it's looking at 
um, you know, what, the, what does the government need to do? What does private industry need to do? And are we making it a solution that is um, ready to address a need that's in the market right now? So, so that's kind of what, what the, the process of this does is first you have a driver um, who's driving this short distance shuttle and it's a low speed, highly defined area that it's running in, not just anywhere. Um, and you put the devices on for autonomous, which are already available to buy right now. And instead of um, making it drive the vehicle, first it collects data and then it creates the, the um, comp all the criteria that you need to, um, to give the vehicle license. So it addresses the two main legal issues with um, self-driving vehicles, which are the licensing, because there is no federal license um, uh, law right now, and liability, basically by letting the government um, assume primary liability, and the only reason that they would do that is if it's proven that that will save them money. Questions for Benjamin over here behind. Chris, what's your? Uh, do you already have the routes that you would run planned? And also, yeah. do you plan to only run at night, or do you plan to run in the daytime? It's six hours a day. There's uh, a route going from downtown Ann Arbor to Pioneer High School, mm -hmm. and then there's. Um, a route going from Pioneer High School to South State Street where there's some restaurants and Firewood Mall. And then on the other end of the neighborhood route there, I've um, done all the research from the census and from the um, uh, Michigan Works uh, Job Placement Agency to really know where the concentration of people that are looking for these jobs live. And so I have to go into those neighborhoods which are um, there's one that's a little bit to the northeast of Ypsilanti City, and there's one that's a little bit southeast of Ypsilanti City. And then there's a, um, and then there's a bus that connects Ypsilanti uh, Transit Center to Pioneer High School, and it's just an express bus that goes back and forth. Yes. Other than your uh, zero emissions, is there a need to have these uh, shuttles electrified? Can they be regular buses, shuttle vans on there? Yeah, it could, it could be done with, with that, but the vehicles themselves are only <clears throat> $15,000 to $25,000. So I guess the economics don't work as well if you use a gas-powered vehicle. So I, I'm, I'm wondering why what would be the purpose for that? If it's electrified, there's definitely a downtime where you'll be charging these shuttles, and uh, a gas or like yep. diesel would have a level one, one battery charge lasts 10 to 13 hours, and there's hours of service where there really is this need is only six hours a day. So the rest of the time is parked. Good, thank you. How fast are these going? Because you mentioned East Ipsy and Ann Arbor. That's like not highway safe, is it? No, no. It's, it's uh, 25 miles an hour is the fastest that they can go. And um, <clears throat> they're only legal on 35 miles an hour or lower roads, of which I've, I've already driven around to make sure that there aren't any 40 mile an hour roads that are on those routes. Do you plan yet for something famous from customers and um, basically, going through the um, job placement agency and the um, chamber of commerce and the DDA, basically going to these businesses and saying, you know, because it, right now it's costing them thousands of dollars, and it's for some restaurants it's actually affecting their ability to stay in business. Um, so they're willing to spend some level of money on that, and at um, the price point that I have at is five dollars and fifty cents per ride, so that's um, substantially cheaper than taking like an Uber or Lyft. Um, and 
um, it should it should be should be something I think that they would. Oh, another thing too is I talked to the DDA and they subsidize three dollars of um, a ride for a night ride. So be, if this is zero emissions, which they like, and this doesn't contribute to congestion, which they like, and does the same thing, then I can get get them to go along with that. Uh, have you pitched to the restaurant owners? Um, I did this uh, for my. Um, for my class, I'm a U of M student. I did this for my class last semester, and my um, colleague in my team did did talk to the to restaurant owners, talk to uh, Main Street Ventures, uh, Savco, and Zingerman's. Those are like the some of the three biggest in the area. Question here. So you're running into a high fixed cost business. Um, you're gonna need money for the EVs and drivers and licensing and all of that. Yep. How do you plan to make I mean, when do you plan to become profitable or even break even? <laughs> um, I've got it all. I've actually got, um, I've got a pro forma in a spreadsheet that tells the entire financial story of it. And that's kind of one of the reasons I'm here is I'd like to see if there's anybody who likes looking at numbers and wants to critique it or see if I forgot something. But um, that's all spelled out. Um, there are a lot of grants available, so actually, from a cash flow standpoint, um, you start, you actually can start off with a fair amount of cash, but I have the investor leaving at five years and making 25%. So basically, from a $305,000 investment, they get a little, almost 600000 In five years? Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right, that's all the time we got. Thank you. <laughs>
Uh, you know, I look at someone who's doing something with AI, and this is basically about the level of a sixth grade science project, maybe. <laughs> but that's part of the idea, is this is, a, this is a very, very simple idea. You can fix these in the field with duct tape if you have to. They're, but they're stronger than a tenth. They're adaptable to two inch panels for, a, uh, for winter use, one inch panels with a lot of windows for, uh, for uh, tropical use. You can deploy these quickly, as I said, they're durable. I've got one made of this material that's over 25 years old. Uh, they're just better than tents, and they're super strong, and the vertical walls are an important element. Uh, who is the, what's the problem that we're solving? Supplying safe, strong shelters? Who needs it? Who doesn't need it right now? There's 15,000 UNHCR employees who need it in the field. They're Davenport, Iowa, the Florida Keys, you name it. I mean, you could probably come up with a hundred other places where there have been disasters where the shelter has been inadequate. Puerto Rico, I didn't even put on here. It's the U.S. Virgin Islands. Don't save FEMA to me. <laughs> um, they approach us and a lot of other companies, and then what did they go with? Blue tarps. Um, anyway, so there's obviously a lot of them. And uh, when the big one hits California, they're going to need them. Here we, oh, hold on, I'm going to show you this one. This will go, please go. This is a wind tunnel test at the Ford Motor Company. Look at that barrier. That, isn't that interesting? It goes around the building like it was a uh, cylinder. And uh, this was at 35 miles an hour. We got up to 86 miles an hour there with this uh, U of M class. And at the University of Michigan, okay, I get it. Uh, so here's some of the, here's the competition. Katrina trailers, I don't have to tell you about those. And you got a storm fully built on top of everything else. Here is the, uh, the, comp the IKEA Better Shelter. Online, the Better Shelter, they assembled one in four hours. Five people in this laboratory, it took them five or four or five hours to put the thing together. So in the field, I'm sure it's not so great. I mean, it's good, They're, they want to design it more. It's better than a tent, but it's basically a pipe frame tent. So who needs it? This woman needs it. After the hurricane, they gave him tents, in, or the earthquake in Haiti, they gave him tents. This arrives at your doorstep, you put it up, and then you take it down. This is the, and here's how it goes down. Roof peels off, and all the panels just come apart. I'm wearing the same suspenders now that I did then. So it's unusual that these things are, it's impossible to reuse most of these things. That's why this is unique. That's, I've got a little floor in there. You can make any kind of floor. You can, in Haiti, we use cement. And there it is. So it's up and down, it's easy. There's a need. And what are we asking for? What am I looking for? I'm looking for advice. I'd love some money, you know, I'm a million dollars, I could go. But I'm certainly looking for advice, help, networking, all those things. So thank you very much. I gotta ask before we jump in that, is anyone surprised that the IKEA version took five hours or four hours? <laughs> <laughs> and, 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 and a gazillion parts, they've got it online. <laughs> Not surprised, a lot of bolts that you don't have anywhere else in your house. Um, all right, what questions do we have? Diane. Um, I saw that you had a, a trademark logo. Um, do you have any intellectual property patents filed? What's, what's the protection of your position? What that is me the, from stealing your idea? Nothing. I would love you to steal my idea, go into the market first, and then I'll follow you. <laughs> uh, trademark and patent, I had a patent, it expired. I have a few patents, but all of them have expired. I've been working on this idea for about 40 years, so this is not exactly a new idea, it's a little unusual, but I started out as a hobby. But I've got, what I've got, patents expire, trademarks expire, they're also, not, excuse me, patents expire and copyrights expire. Trademarks do not expire. So that's what I've got is trademark protection. Assuming we're the first ones into the market, then you've got some privacy. Uh, and it's a big market. So the answer is, if someone wants to do it, I've got a, lot, a fair amount of trade secret too involved. But that's a good question. Yes, sir. Uh, can you cook inside of one? Absolutely. Uh, and I have. I've, we've camped out in Canada. We've set up stoves. I, you could build a fire in them. I have not built a fire inside one, and I'm not sure how they, the air circulates like this in the dome. So instead of going up that hole without a, without, as long as you had a 
stove, but the stove pipe, you're fine. But if you just try so to build it. doesn't it, draft up? It, it, no, and circulate and then draft out eventually. But you need a stove pipe, is my, what I, I would say. Yes, sir. Uh, have you considered marketing this to people who work in uh, very expensive cities? In what? <laughs> <laughs> you say dispensable cities? <laughs> Yeah, I've done some work in the homeless market, and and uh, because th th that's the bottom line for expenses up in cities. I've worked in San Francisco. I've got pictures of, of a homeless thing in San Francisco. Uh, but yes, I, you could. I mean, these I, these are, are livable shelters. There, we got out of the single family market very early on uh, because of all the code issues. But but this panel is a code approved panel. They use them to build garage doors and sunrooms. So uh, so people know what this is, in a, even though I'm using it in a different application. Yes, sir. Uh, I saw that you were using power tools along the slides. That, isn't that going to be a problem here for bringing it to a developing country that doesn't have electricity? Well, Haiti is a pretty developing country, but uh, yes, it is. And I've, in, in Bangladesh, we've assembled them by hand okay. with a. With a uh, nut driver, and I, you can assemble some of them. There's so many ways to assemble. I put the one in the Ford Motor Company wind tunnel was half bolted together, and then that is the panels and the connectors, and we put it together with zip ties, and it was zip tied to the floor. It did zip ties, but uh, so you know, there's different ways. You can through bolt them, you can screw them, you can nail them together. Honest to God, nail them together. The, the connectors have a hole in them. You can just drive a nail right through. Them. Let's go to the right side over here. Okay, I'm sorry. Yeah. What's your price for these? Pardon me? What's your price per unit for these? My cost right now is about 3500 a unit for the big one, the one inch thick aluminum skin foam quartz panel. So I think I could retail them for about five. And that's, I'm paying everything right now is retail prices. You know what I'm saying? I'm not getting quantity discounts. So I assume you could bring that price down. Right. Yes. And how much the fees? Pardon me? The PCs, this one? Yeah. These? Yeah, how much is this? Uh, this is about $5 a square foot. And this is about 50 cents a square foot. So there's a range. There's, there are some that you drop into a developed country and then you stucco them. They're just foam with, held together with, with connectors. And you can put cement or stucco on them locally. Yes, sir. Oh, wait, hold on. Let me get over here again. I'm sorry. Yes, ma'am. Do you have a question? No? Oh, I had a question about the price point, but you already oh. answered it. So. Oh, okay. Yes, sir. Do you have a dollar amount on your market size? You said this person needs it, that person needs it, but I, unless I, I might have not be paying attention, I didn't really see a clearly defined dollar sign. A dollar market? Yeah. yeah, I don't I don't know exactly what it is. I mean, there are people who made estimates. It's in the gazillion dollar range. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I have one more question. How much do they weigh? That unit weighs about 350 pounds. In plywood, it weighs 900 pounds. All right, that's all the time we got. Thank you. And then our last pitch for the evening is Operism. And Operism is being pitched by Bob Bishop. Operism is a surgical team communication app with a focus on orthopedic surgery, major joint reconstruction, and spine reconstruction, to be specific. So Bob is going to pitch opera them for us. Thank you. Hi, everybody. So I'm going to do this a little differently, but Operhythm is solving a problem that few people know about, which is that surgeries can be done way more consistently, and they're being done very inconsistently now in the time of surgery. There are problems because this is caused by the idea that we will have safer surgeries. In other words, 
the global requirement for sterility and decontamination for the devices and their instrumentation is causing the root cause problem for the surgeries to go longer. For primarily orthopedic surgery, because of the number of instruments that are involved. How's the problem being solved today? So we have providers, we have payers, and we have patients. And the providers are specializing and subspecializing because the procedure is a relatively new thing. It was probably in the 70s or 80s that it became successful enough to get a 80 to 85 percent range. And we're at a point now where if you don't have a successful procedure, you're basically uh, incompetent. With what they're doing is very different than what Henry Ford did many, 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 many years ago, which was take a car and was able to make it at first 500 minutes at the assembly plant and got it down to four. That was before he had an assembly line. And he continued to make them so fast out the door that he continued to dominate the market. So what's different is that we have best practices at best and no consistency in the way things are done. The payers primarily are the United States government because most of the patients who have a total joint what happened? Peter wants to say about that. Uh, most of the patients who have a total joint are Medicare age and therefore being paid for by the United States government. The remainder, about 20% for total joints, are private pay. But it's a lot more money if you're private pay. And so companies like Walmart are using centers of excellence to send people to. And the patients are just throwing their hands up and going, oh my God, if I have to do this, I may go bankrupt. They don't have a good solution. So why is my solution better? Because it, it directly addresses the root cause. And it puts the surgeon in charge of the design of the procedure, which is currently not the case. It is the Zimmer. It is Stryker. It is Johnson & Johnson's Depew division who designed these systems and hand them to the surgeons. I know that because that's what I did and I delivered them. So what traction do I have so far? I'm, because I have been in this business a long time, I'm connected throughout the whole country. And I have both spine surgeons and total joint surgeons who are already expressing interest in investing and participating. <clears throat> we have decades of experience. One of my key partners in this is an MIT engineer who is out in San Diego and has worked with me in several of these companies. Um, so let me go back because I wanted to tell you what I'm going to tell you and then tell you some more. So here is a paper that was published last year about the variability of case durations and interestingly on Liberty here in Ann Arbor is the operation that collects this data. But what it showed was that the durations of surgeries is dramatically wide. And in fact, in the discrepancy between the best institutions and the worst, it's three times longer. This is something I knew intuitively from being around the country, but how big of a problem is it? Now, it continues to be a problem for me to keep this up, but it is orthopedic surgery is the number one surgery in the United States and it is growing by 25% a year. It is the biggest cost for hospitalization and by Medicare. It is the case that orthopedic surgeons are walking around the target on them. And this CJR that I had up here before is a government operation to control prices, you bundle what you do and you get the lowest price. The solution is a
printed 3D nylon, which I can sterilize. It lays the instruments out in an orientation and in a sequence that is completely different than they're currently delivered. It organizes the case and allows for it to go quickly. Thank you. Questions for Bob? Right here. So the, sorry, the most expensive component of an orthopedic case is the orthopedic surgeon. And an orthopedic surgeon at the peak of his career these days is making six or seven million dollars a year in terms of operating his practice. So the issue has to do with who saves the money and the orthopedic surgeons who are at Rush Presbyterian in Chicago are doing a thousand cases a year. The typical orthopedic surgeon here in Michigan is doing 300. So the opportunity for them is to do a completely massive change in terms of their efficiency. And that same thing goes for the hospital. The average case paid for by the government is 33000 paid for by private payers is typically $45,000 to $50,000. There's a million done a year. So it's a $50 billion a year operation. Yes, sir? So with the change in focus from a fee-for-service to quality-based reimbursement, Yes. how do you prove that your quality is good and, and, and you know, the typically patients are not going to need uh, repeat surgery? 10, 15 years down the line. So I'm not doing anything to make the case go helter-skelter. The procedures are not being driven to be like a race. Instead, what they're, the, what's happening is that they're being done with a low variance. So the opportunity is not to take somebody who's doing the case in 45 minutes and make them do it in 30 issue is to take somebody who's doing it in three hours and take them down to two, and to an hour and a half, and then closer to 45. There should be absolutely no change in terms of the quality. This does not drive the surgeon to go faster. It just organizes the instrumentation in sequence and in orientation physically to, be, to simplify the, the supply chain to them of the people actually handing them the instruments. Do you have any numbers on how much reduction is? Like you, you mentioned three to two and a half. Yeah. So we obviously didn't want to do it in the operating room. So we made a model out of die, dice. And what we found was that underneath the hood, without getting into the details here, we're going to have a lot of time, but a die has 24 orientations six sides, four twists. And what we found was unusual, which is that there are more opportunities to turn the die a longer distance than a shorter distance. In other words, randomly rolling them and then getting them into the right orientation, on average, takes longer in, than if you oriented. So if we pre-orient versus random with die, we have 24 times the improvement. I did this with my 88-year-old mother, and I did it with my uh, nieces and nephews. They all do it longer if they're my mom. They all do it shorter if the kids. However, the average, when we looked at this, we took and did statistical analysis, and we calculated the information load in Shannon terms and found that that was a direct correlation logarithmically and it explained what was going on underneath the hood that was not being seen, which is that the orientation itself has not been appreciated far, as far as the time cost that's involved. I have a question. Can you um, just briefly summarize again what the app is and what it does? So the dilemma here is that the ultimate product is this 3D printed nylon uh, holder that I can do real time. But the app is to allow the surgeon or his aide to select the orient, the, the, excuse me, the order that they're going to use them in and the orientation. So the app will be a simple drag and drop 
and twist to do it the way they're currently doing it. One of the simple things to do is, if anybody knows what a mail stand is, it's like a cafeteria tray right above the patient. You take a picture of that and you start by continuing to make it that way every time. And then you can iterate it because you can 3D print new solutions for them. Got it. One more question. So there are already operating feeders that are doing this in the low time. Yes. Why are they able to do this? It's a great question because I didn't happen upon this accidentally. I started to work in, in Dallas about 28 years ago with a surgeon who came from Boston and we were doing cases at Dallas Presbyterian Hospital. It took us all day Tuesday to do two cases. He brought in some consultants. We, we went to the hospital and said that we wanted to do two rooms, get an executed team, get it all nailed down. And they said we can't do that because the nurses union just agreed that they would only scrub two cases on the service in a row. He said, okay, we're leaving. So don't do that. Let's go out to Plano, which we did. And we started doing cases out there with this three OR setup that was brand new. And we began doing the cases. Six months later, we were doing eight cases a day. Everything was calm. The music was still playing. The jokes were still being told. And anytime anything went wrong, it was immediately obvious because it was so different. And we all stood back and said, that's not right, and fixed it. And then one time. I thought for sure, because I was winning sales contests all over the place, that this would just take off. But because the word you use, the operating theater, is a misnomer, there's no such thing. Yes, on Seinfeld, the junior mitt ended up in the patient. But there, I've never been in OR all around the country where there literally were people watching from above. What really goes on is that there are dark rooms with very few windows that no one ever sees anybody else do a case in. So if you graduate after having a subspecialty, you never see anybody else ever do a case again. Almost never. And so you don't even know what best practice is. So exporting that is very difficult. And it's also met with huge suspicion at the big society meetings when Dr. <coughs> Berger at Rush is saying, I'm doing 1,000 cases a year. The guy from Lansing says, no, my guy, that's insane. It must be mass surgery, and it's not. But there's a huge resistance culturally to believe that it's possible and to do it. All right. Thank you very much. Excellent. Well, great pitches tonight. Thanks, everyone who pitched. Um, now it's time for our post-pitch announcements, our community announcements time. So if you have an announcement you'd like to make to the group, um, please keep it to one to two minutes, and you can line up right over here in front of this whiteboard. Uh, and then you can also use those markers to write your information on the board after you're done announcing. If you want to leave an email address or the name of your company or um, name of your event or URL. So if you have a meetup you want to promote, a position you're hiring for, looking for a collaborator, collaborator, etc., come on down, line up here, don't be shy. And then you can step up right to where I am right here so Roger can um, catch you on the video and make your announcement. Again, keep it to one to two minutes, please. Come on up. All right, hello everyone. Uh, my name is Scott Gosey and I got a couple of quick announcements, so I'll go fast. Uh, one, if you like some of the startups that you saw here tonight and decide that you want to build your own but you don't know how to program, uh, there's a meetup for that. Uh, Michelle and I run Ann Arbor Coffeehouse Coders, which meets about once a month for programming. And so if you want to learn how to program, you can find us on Meetup and I'll post that in the Meetup description. Now on the other side, if you are looking for co-working space, uh, or you're just uh, talking so that way other people can't hear the uh, conversation that's going on over here. <laughs> Which is always polite, right? You know? So uh, if you're looking for co working space, there's a great place called the Tech Brewery that you can check out that has, uh, you can buy desks uh, individually so that way you can build your startup up from one desk to four or more. Uh, so if you want to, you can check out at techbrewery.org and I'll put that in the meetup description too as well. So check the meetup description afterwards and you'll find all these details. Thanks. Good evening, everybody. I'm James. This is Phoenix. Oh, wow. 
I'm a product designer for a company called Wearology. We're a social we're a social enterprise with the goal to create products for uh, adaptive products for people with disabilities. And uh, our first to market product is Buttons to Button. It's a three component system that you can add to any almost any dress shirt. It uses a magnet and metal to turn to make a dress shirt easy to pull apart or snap together to make the act of dressing easier for people with um, some kind of dexterity limitation. And so we're looking for um, we're looking for people to collaborate with and we're looking we're interested in finding out who's investing in um, social mission consumer companies such as us. So um, I'll put the website up and anytime anybody who wants to uh, chat with me after come and see me. Hi, I'm Dani. I'm the co-director of the Ann Arbor Health Hacks. We are a non-profit organization which acts as a hub for community-driven healthcare innovation. Um, so what we would like to do is bring our community together to solve important problems in, in healthcare in general. Our flagship event is a 48-hour um, health hackathon, which is taking place in September uh, the 21st and the 22nd. And what we're looking for are participants, we're looking for board members that want to join our mission, we're looking for partners to just get this project running. So if you're interested in it, you can talk to me afterwards, I'm going to put our info up and then, yeah, hope to see a few faces later on. Hi everyone, I'm Heather Martell. I'm the CEO of Project Fred. Um, uh, we are a fractionalized commercial real estate tech company. Um, we are putting commercial real estate on the blockchain and making it available for all. Right now, our biggest ask and our great call that I'm here to ask you for is we need Ann Arbor property. Anything multi-unit properties, commercial properties, anything that you may own and you want uh, to make it liquid. So uh, we can find you funding. We have, we're working on proof of concept right now. We would love to have uh, additional properties. I'll put my information up and feel free to contact us. Thanks. All right. Uh, hello everyone. Uh, my name is Luke Donahue. Uh, I'm here on behalf of the New Enterprise Forum. Uh, New Enterprise Forum is a group of angel investors and business professionals in the Southeast Michigan area. Um, and they get together on a volunteer basis to provide coaching, um, startup coaching, and really pitch advice. So, um, a few of you mentioned in your pitches today that we go th that you're looking for help putting together your financial metrics and getting yourself ready to actually try to uh, solicit venture capital or private equity or angel funding. Um, that's what this group really focuses on. Again, it's called New Enterprise Forum. Um, we meet once a month for a pitch event. Um, to allow you to pitch similar to this, but um, maybe with a little bit more of an ask, um, with uh, more of a, uh, what I want to say, uh, more in details into the pro forma and into the actual nitty gritty that the investors would like to see. So it's a great uh, community, great event, and we're actually looking for startups, so it's an invitation to uh, join us. Uh, again, newenterpriseforum.org. So uh, first thing is that I wanted to introduce Mercantile, which is a co-working space on Main Street focused on remote employees and freelancers. So if you're looking for a community, um, stop by for a tour or a free day, come and check us out. We're having an open house uh, next month as well, so that's an opportunity to come and, and see the space and um, you know, get an introduction to that community. The second thing is that the company that I work for, Trace, we are hiring um, a machine learning and computer vision engineer, and I will put up the details for our careers page on the board. Thanks. Hey everyone, I'm Demi from Zonder, a mobile app that gamifies traveling, and we're looking for a React Native developer that can commit 20 plus hours of remote work a week. This is an equity position. Um, I'm going to put my email up there, uh, so let me know if you have any questions. Hey, good evening everyone. I'm Will Orlowitz. Uh, I'm a data, data privacy attorney. 
And uh, I just wanted to announce a free lunch and learn event. It's co-hosted by myself and another company called Block Harbor Cybersecurity. It's gonna be at uh, We Work Merchants Row in Detroit on June 12th uh, from 12 to 1.30. So we're gonna be talking about um, how to secure your product, how to comply with all the latest data privacy regulations. And so it's good for startups, app developers, web developers, and things like that. Thank you. Hi, I'm uh, Garrett Stuckey, and I host a Startup 360 podcast where I sit down with uh, founders and interview them on a 360 camera, which I have here. Uh, so uh, if you are doing a startup, please contact me. Um, also, please subscribe to my channel on YouTube. Uh, startup360.com, startup360podcast.com, or 734-274-9521 is my cell phone. Thank you. David, you gonna say something about Tech Trek? Sure. Um, Tech Trek is coming up on June 6th. I think it's now called A2 Track 360, something like that. Um, so, uh, who knows the most about Tech Trek in the room and wants to talk a little bit about that, actually? I'm a little bit more out of the loop than usual this year. Diane, go ahead. Um, so, A2 Tech 360 is an Arbor's answer to South by Southwest. Um, how many people have ever heard of South by Southwest? All right, a good amount of folks. So, basically, it is, it, 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 we're not there yet, but, but you have to think about the future, right? We're talking entrepreneurship, future thinking. Um, it's a, it's, it's a week-long event with lots of sub-events that celebrate arts, culture, community, and entrepreneurship. And the part that you asked about is, the, is, is specifically the tech track, which is on Friday, June 6th. 6th. Um, that is basically a walking tour of the tech companies in downtown Ann Arbor. Um, they started this four years ago and expected maybe a hundred people to show up. I believe 200 people showed up and it has grown every year since then. I believe last year about 5,000 people showed up. I don't have the numbers very tightly, but, but you know, rough idea. Um, the sign up for companies for Tech Trek is completely sold out. So if you have a tech company and you want people on that pub crawl like thing of open houses in downtown Ann Arbor to show up, you're out of luck, but mark your calendars. This is one of the more fun things to do in Ann Arbor on that Friday, probably the single most fun thing to do in Ann Arbor that Friday. The other thing though, while I have your attention, is the day right before that is Tech on the Edge, also an event in the, in the context of A2 Tech 360, and that is for companies that are not downtown. Um, and, and my particular area is, is engineering and biomedical companies, companies that need labs. And so the event is mostly for those. Practically, though, there's a couple of IT companies that will be at that as well. It'll be a big party with a band, booze, and barbecue. Um, uh, that is on the Thursday, June, the day before that, yeah, fifth. fifth. Um, should be a, both of those events are free. A lot of events of A2 Tech 360 are free. Um, mark that entire week of the 2nd until the 10th on your calendar. Look at the awesome stuff happening. Monday and Tuesday is intermittent. Um, who's heard about intermittent? Not a lot of people. Look that up as well. If, you, if you're looking to get involved in the community and really make a difference in this town and in this area, intermittent is a great conference. There's TED Talks, there's all sorts of stuff. And it is organized by Ann Arbor Spark. And I don't work there, so I just know it because I'm involved in organizing Tech on the Edge, to which I want you all to show up. <laughs> awesome. Thanks, Diane. Yeah, highly recommend checking those out. I think last year I went to Tech Talks and uh, took a picture with a Corvette on a mobility row, climbed inside an autonomous bus, there's live music and all this stuff. So, uh, Tech Trek is an awesome event. Uh, I've been part of companies for a few years that have presented at it, so you get to talk to the whole community that's coming through and show off what you're working on. And vice versa, if you're on the other side of the table, you get to go around and learn about what all these companies are doing. They open their doors to you. Um, there's lots of times giveaways and things like that too, I think, in the different companies. So. Definitely it's kid friendly to the tech. Yes, kid friendly. So if you have kids or if you're kind of like a kid at heart, um, they <laughs> definitely welcome to, uh, welcome you in. And usually they have free pizza in the Spark Building, I think. So don't know if they're still doing that. I mean, like these are five thousand people. It's a lot of pizza, but I think they're still doing that too. So definitely check that out. Um, check out the website for A2 Tech 360 and uh, take advantage of everything there.
So as we wrap up, um, we are always on the third Tuesday of each, each month meeting. And so our next A2 New Tech meetup is Tuesday, June 18th. So mark it on your Palm Pilot or whatever you got. Um, and as of this moment, we do have spaces open for pitches in June and July. So if you want to pitch, let me know. Um, and we'd love to hear what you uh, would like to pitch. We'll ask you some questions about it to learn what stage you're at and let you know if we can get you in. Um, if you do know someone who should pitch or if you want to pitch, you can have them email us or you can send us a message at organizers at a2newtech.org. It's organizers at a2newtech.org. And the criteria we generally look for in these companies that pitch is that um, ideally they've done some customer validation, um, maybe spoken with prospective customers, and at least um, potentially hopefully built a prototype as well. It's very easy to these days to build some kind of a prototype to show your idea. Um, and so uh, we ideally look for companies that have that so they have something they can show. Um, so do reach out and let us know if you have a pitch um, idea for these next couple of months as we're looking to fill up those rosters. And like I mentioned before the pitches, make sure to find us at our Slack team uh, in the next month if you want to stay connected at madeinda2.com slash Slack. And while you're at it, you can just take a couple letters off the URL and check out madeinda2.com. Um, which is, has a directory of different tech companies in the area and info about some of the tech community here. And so I uh, recommend you check that out if you haven't been there before. So as we wrap up, show of hands, who's planning to join us over at Dominic's about a block away? Awesome, looks like we still have some light outside. We might be seated outside, we'll see. Um, bring a jacket, it's a little, little bit chillier than usual, but it'll get warmer in the coming months. We should be at Dominic's for the rest of the summer. Um, and so plan on that going forward. Um, and just a quick note about it, the venue is 21 plus, so I don't think they allow people in under 21 generally. Um, and that's at 812 Monroe Street, which again is right next door. So thanks everybody, we'll see you next month or over at Dominic's.